You know, I asked uh, you guys to share with one another almost disaster stories. Did anyone have one that was like, oh, I, I want to share this? All right, I'll, I'll share mine. It's okay. I came prepared. When I was, uh, Kara and I were newly married, my parents gave us a set of bicycles. And these bikes were older than I am. My parents had, had spent the money in the 80s, got some really nice bikes, and 30 some years later, they're still really nice bicycles. And the day came, Kara and I wanted to take them to the coast with us. So we decided to make an investment in our bicycles by buying a bike trailer. And when I say investment, what I mean is I went down to Walmart and I spent $40 on the absolute cheapest bike trailer that I could find because that's what I could afford. And there's that question of, do I trust this to keep my stuff safe or not? And we did a couple short trips around town and it seemed like this was going to work. So the, the day came and we drove to Cannon Beach to Seaside. It's an hour and a half um, down the road. And I got out of the car and I went around the car to check on the bikes. And by the good grace of God, our bikes were still there. Because I had made a mistake. Um, I put my, bikes, my wife's bicycle on and strapped it down. And then I had put my bike into the, the saddle holders and gotten distracted because I didn't actually tie it down. So from Portland to Seaside, the only thing that held my bike on the car was gravity. And my bike was still there. <laughs> Praise God. You know, I, I just, I thank him for those almost disasters. Those things that just could have gone so much worse. And this morning, we're going to look at an almost disaster in the early church. Something that that could have just ripped this new community of Jesus apart, and yet it didn't. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6. But whether you're new to this series or whether, like me, you just need maybe a reminder this morning, even though Luke and Acts, the series we're going through, is a single work in two volumes. I know in our Bible it's separated by the Gospel of John, but this is one continuous story all about the fact that God the Father sent Jesus, the promised Messiah, to save all who follow him and to empower them with his Holy Spirit so they can live like him. And that is the goodness that we're in right now because we have heard the story of Jesus and his death and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven and the Holy Spirit has come. And now in these early chapters of Acts, we are witnessing Jesus' followers doing the things that Jesus did. And that brings us to Acts chapter 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn the responsibility over to them. And I will give our attention, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon and Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, who was a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And we all go, whoo, that was close, right? Well, we should. We should. I don't know how, how much of a powder keg you guys see in this, but in those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. And to understand why this is uh, potentially such a, a serious issue, let's go back to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. This is the, the birthday of the church. Peter had just preached a message saying, Jesus was God's Messiah, and you all killed him. And they're all like, what do we do? And he says, repent in the name of Jesus. And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off whom our Lord, the Lord our God will call. And that day, like 3,000 people got saved. And this is what we read immediately afterwards. And, and by the way, this is, this is the, the gold standard, if you will. This is the ideal to which every Jesus community should aspire to be. And they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is the, the teaching about Jesus. These days, we'd say the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, which are all about Jesus. They're devoting themselves to this. And to the fellowship, that is to sharing, to recognizing that because others, even though they weren't part of our family, they might not even speak the same language, but they're a Jesus person, we're family now, and we share things together. And, and to the breaking of bread, uh, to commemorating Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, and to just eating together all the time, and to prayer, to calling on God, to in praise and in worship and in intercession and asking Him to fix this world and our lives, they gave themselves entirely to these things. And everyone was filled with awe, with, with fear and wonder at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles who are testifying to Jesus and doing the things that Jesus was doing. And all the believers were together. They had everything in common. And they said property and possessions, uh, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They're taking care of the community needs. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts for worship and praise of God. And they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. They're, they're people who are full of gratitude and thanks and praise. And they are enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Like, this is what the church should be. And I mean, this is my prayer for Family of Grace, that we together would flourish into this more and more as we give ourselves to it, as we devote ourselves to these things. So if this is the standard, and then we come back to chapter 6, verse 1, in those days, something happened that turned the community of gratitude, thanks, and praise into a community of complaints and grumbling. Um, it's, it's the same word that uh, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament thousands of years ago, they used for describing the Israelites in the wilderness, like Exodus 16, Numbers 17, and their complaints and grumbling. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, let's just say it wasn't the highlight of the history of the nation of Israel. And now grumbling is happening in this community. And, and it's, uh, you know, in the early church, everyone's needs were being met. Oh. Only now they're not. And everyone was together, a, a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church, and now the church is beginning to fracture around racial ethnic lines. If you're not familiar with the term Hellenistic, it refers to people from a Greek background. It comes from Helen of Troy, if you are familiar with that story. And so you have, you have Jesus followers who are Jews, but perhaps speak a different language, perhaps dress differently, eat the wrong kinds of food, and don't act appropriately, who come from the outside, who are complaining against the locals. The, the Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking Jews who, who look like us and sound like us, and they're saying, you guys are neglecting our widows. Oh, and widows aren't being taken care of in this early church, which is another big deal because God cares about widows, so much so that, that later in the New Testament, James will write, if you guys want to know what pure religion looks like, live a holy life and take care of orphans and widows, and it, it is not happening. So we have a church conflict over issues like money and resources. Do we know of any churches that have had issues over money and resources? Or perhaps a church that has had tensions over racial and ethnic differences? Or churches that have had issues because some members of the congregation tell other members of the congregation, you don't care about us and you're not meeting our needs? And we... We start realizing that this is a powder keg that could so easily explode. And that's what makes what happens next so amazing as a problem is solved when the right people are doing the right work. 
So the 12, the 12 apostles gather all the disciples together. At this point, the church is over 5,000 people. So this is, this is a big event. Everybody get in here. We need to talk. And when the noise settles, they announce to the group that it would not be right. Some of your Bibles will say it would not be good, not, not pleasing, not ideal for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Um, that word wait there is the word serve in Greek. And the only reason that's important is because it comes up again in the next verse. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we're going to turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Same, uh, same Greek word, service. So it's not that the 12 are unwilling to serve. They're already serving. And they're saying, we need to not neglect what Jesus has given to us. So you guys pick seven people, and the, the qualifications we're going to give you is character. Are they full of the Holy Spirit? Are they wise? We're looking for character first, and, and then competency second. But you guys pick them. We will pray for them and, and just give this problem over to them to handle. And we're going to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. And everyone was good with it. And so they chose these seven men, Stephen and Philip, whom we see in the, we'll see next week and the week after. And the rest of the men we don't know anything about, we've never heard of, and we won't hear about them again. But if you look at their names, like Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, they are Greek-sounding names, which leads some to believe that they selected men from the disenfranchised community. They actually said, the, you who have the problem, we're going to pick men from your own midst to take care of it, which seems pretty wise. And they presented these men to the apostles. They prayed. They laid their hands on them, uh, a public sign of appointing someone for a special ministry. And the church flourished because the right people were doing the right work. And it says the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You know, th this last uh, line here makes me wonder, why now? Why did a large number of priests come to the faith, and why is it described right now? Because if you were at the camp out, you know, last week we were in Acts chapter 5, and at that time there weren't a lot of priests being believers. There were a lot of priests involved in arresting the apostles and putting them on trial. But in that trial, a wise man, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, stood up and said, um, we should be careful what we do with these men. If this Jesus movement is just something that humans came up with, it's going to fail. And if it's something that God is doing, then we can't stop it and we might be fighting against God which wouldn't be a good thing. And it's as if this religious teacher is saying, this Jesus movement should be looked at closely and just watched. What is going to happen? And here at the end of our story, we find out that a great number of priests were being saved. And it just makes me wonder if maybe these priests are looking into the church and watching how they are handling the situation with widows and the distribution, and they just go, wow, this really is of... God, look at that. Now, I don't know, but at the end of the day, a bunch of priests got saved, and we can say, praise God for it. So, so what do we see? Well, we see something exciting. The apostles are looking like Jesus. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, the guy who had authority and power to, you know, control the weather and to cast out demons and to heal people, even just with a word, and to raise the dead. He wasn't a, a power hog, in fact, Jesus intentionally gives responsibility away. He sends out 12 and then 72 that he is empowered with his authority to go and act in his name, to go heal people and to announce the good news of God's kingdom. And now we have Jesus' followers, the 12, who are empowering the next set of leaders in the church. And we see the community selecting men of proven character who are spirit-filled to fix the problem. Again, if you want a, a leadership position in the church, good news, it's based on 
character, not on competency, or at least that's not the first issue. Um, you look around our world and we really like people who are competent, we like people who are charismatic, who are powerful leaders, and then of course it's no wonder that then there's major moral failing and we end up calling for their resignation because of sexual abuse scandals, uh, to allude to a recent uh, political scandal that's been going on. But in the church, it's about character. Are you spirit-filled? And then we also see that the men selected came from, at least we think, the community that was experiencing the problem, which is just wise. And so with it, we just see the word of God increases. When spirit-filled Jesus followers devote themselves to their particular service of the word, of prayer, and of meeting community needs in this passage, or to make it short, of the church thrives when the right people do the right work. And the disaster was averted. It's like, whew, that was close. So if the church thrives when the right people, meaning people of character, spirit-filled people are doing the right work, meaning that the tasks that they need to devote themselves to, that they can say yes to this and no to these other good things because they need to say yes to this. Um, it, re- it just reminds me of, of churches that we have today and the spectrum of priorities. I don't know if you guys have experienced this. This is true to my experience of the church. I hope it's true to yours. But there are some churches that tend to gravitate towards the ministry of the Word of God and to prayer and to say that meeting community needs is not as important. And then there's other churches and people that say meeting community needs is really important. And so much so that if we neglect the Word of God in prayer, then it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. But this morning I want to talk about the fact that both are necessary. So meeting needs is necessary for the gospel. If you, uh, for those of us who grew up in the the Word of God and prayer section, I just want to draw our attention to the fact that in the early church in chapter 2, in the amazing summary of what we should be in chapter 4, they are meeting needs all the time. There's no needy people among them. And it is part and parcel of the gospel. Jesus met people's needs as he announced the Word of God. It's not presented as something that's optional. There's no, uh, we don't see anything where the early church tried to say, oh, you know, your widows don't really matter that much and it's going to be okay. It's like, no, this is serious and we need to take care of it. And when we meet our needs, we have an avenue for preaching the word of God and prayer. Uh, I was talking to a guy, he said their church found that service was the key card to get them into um, the ability to actually uh, tell people about Jesus. Like it was the key to community uh, around them, whether in the church or out of the church. And so this is just something we need to do. But there are other people who say that the church is only relevant insofar as we are meeting social needs. So we need to take care of homelessness. We need to feed people. We need to clothe people. um, We need to be doing stuff. And that is what is most important. Um, And so it it doesn't really matter if we're telling people about Jesus or not. And this passage highlights the fact that that is not true either. It's all important. And there's many ways to try to argue that. Um, Many of them take a long time. So I will just point you back to Jesus. When Jesus showed up on the scene, he said that God's spirit had anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to announce to people that now is the time that God is favorable. Come, be forgiven. Come, be blessed by God. He loves you. And to set the oppressed free. Jesus came and he healed people, but he says, I've been sent to preach the good news. There's a message that people have to have because a shirt or a warm meal in the belly is not going to solve the issues, the problems of even one life, let alone societies. The only thing that's going to heal this world and and redeem broken, lost people is the good news of what God has done in and through Jesus Christ. They are both necessary. And of course, we also see in this passage the necessity of character. We're not looking for the, the sharpest crayons in the box. 
We're not looking for bright and flashy lights. We're not looking for, you know, party tricks and clickbait in the church. We are looking for people of character, people who are, have a good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. I mean, later in the New Testament, when uh, Paul writes to Timothy and to Titus about the requirements to, to even lead the church, the offices, you know, you have the, the elder overseers, and then you have the servants, the deacons, and the qualifications, they're all character qualities. With the, and the only skills that are required are, can you, for the overseers and elders, can you teach? Are you hospitable? Everything else is, well, it's, it's character issues. These are what matter, and that's what we aspire to here uh, at Family of Grace. So we, just, we see the church thrives when the right people are doing the right work. Um, sorry to go back to that. And again, the right people, we're talking about spirit-filled people of character doing the right work. The right work for the apostles was the ministry of the word, of telling people of Jesus and praying and the right work for the seven were widows, at least for a season. Later, when we come upon Stephen and Philip, we don't hear anything more about the widows. The problem was just taken care of. That's all that we needed to hear about it. But we saw the church gathering together, treating needs as significant, being unified, and, and fighting to preserve the, the unity of the Spirit. So ways to respond this morning is, of course, one, if you haven't chosen to follow Jesus choose to follow Jesus because the needs of your life and the needs of this world cannot be met simply with a hot meal with a shirt on your back. That our needs go far deeper than that. And God in Jesus Christ has come to earth to redeem that which is broken and to set free those people and those things that are trapped and to change this world to be ultimately what it is always intended to be. But for us, we can choose to live life our own way or we can stop that because it doesn't work and we can live life according to Jesus and his sake. And I just invite you, follow Jesus. I mean, and if anyone here wants to follow Jesus and hasn't been baptized, like we have a tank in the back, I will fill it and we will baptize you today. Like we're gonna make that happen. But for the rest of us, I would say, let's be filled with the Spirit course, what does that mean? Um, in Galatians 5, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When you accept Jesus, God's personal presence and power comes to reside inside of you. Uh, to use a video game analogy, it's as if when you choose to follow Jesus, all of a sudden a brand new menu becomes accessible to you that you've never had access to before. And now you, ha you have a choice between living the way that you used to live and making those same kind of decisions, or you can do something brand new. But these two things, they war at each other. But the more we are filled with the Spirit, the more we choose to walk in step with the Spirit and choose things like love, joy, and peace, and self-control instead of things like drunkenness, and gossip, and envy, and gluttony, and other things, well, the more of the Spirit we have, the less room there is for that other kind of stuff. Or in Ephesians 5, walking by the Spirit, fill, being filled with the Spirit means being less filled by other kinds of spirits and, and singing a lot, actually. Being really, really grateful all the time to God for what He has done and being willing to submit ourselves to one another, to, to give up my needs and pref my desires and preferences in order to love you because of what Christ has done for me. Like, let us be filled with the Spirit. And then let us recognize the needs of the body. Are there anything, is there anything that we see in, in our church especially and outside the church that if we don't deal with this, people are going to be driven away from Jesus? And, and if appropriate, let's meet those needs. And if it's not appropriate for us to be the ones to meet the needs, let us pray and empower those who can. Because the church is going to thrive when the right people do the right work. And here I want to pivot for a second. Because I don't know if it happened this morning, 
but it definitely happened when I was trying to figure out how to communicate this, that I realized by the end of the sermon, I'm like hitting people with this truth of like, y'all need to be better. Like pick yourself up by your own spiritual bootstraps. And, uh, and I really need to not, not do that. Because Acts chapter 6 is actually built on Acts 1 through 5. Acts 1 through 5 is built upon the entire gospel and good news of Jesus. And, the, and all the gospels are built upon the foundation of the prophets and the Hebrew Bible. And we need to be reminded about what God has done for us in Jesus um, so that we can respond appropriately. Jesus is not only God come as man to announce good news to us. Um, the author of Hebrews calls Jesus our high priest. He's actually the go-between between us and God. So he comes to us from God to announce good news, to call us to repentance, to say that our sins have been forgiven. But as a high priest, he also does something equally important. He comes before God in our stead to offer back to God appropriate worship, to give back to God thanks for what God has done on our behalf, to make prayers on our behalf to God. Like all of our work has been done for us in Jesus. And now through the Spirit, we're just invited to, to share in his love with the Father, to share in the work that he has already completed because we're going to thrive because the right person, Jesus, has done the right work on our behalf. And basically what I'm getting at is to say because of Jesus, you can't fail. Because of Jesus, it's not like God is up there angry and upset because you have failed to hold up your end of the bargain when it comes to loving and serving the church. See, no, no, no. Because of Jesus, you are loved and you are whole and the work has been done. But now you can come and share in it because Jesus was the right person who did the right work on our behalf. But this morning, I want us to talk. I'm going to give us like three minutes as Eric comes up. And just to ask ourselves the questions, like do we see any needs in our community, first in, in family of grace and then in the broader community that are unaddressed? And are any of those needs ones that that I am supposed to take care of personally or you. All right, let me pray for us and then let, let's talk for three. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for uh, your spirit. Thank you that you are the God who has not left us alone uh, to try to respond in our own strength to what you've done, but you have equipped and empowered us with everything that we need for life and godliness, that in Jesus you have loved us and that in Jesus you are praying for us. You are worshiping for us. You are doing work for us. Thank you for the Spirit that, that prays for us when we don't even know how to pray. What a good God you are. And yet, Father, I do ask that we would be people who care about this community of faith, devoted to, to the Word of God and to prayer and to fellowship and to remembering what Christ has done, that we would be taking care of the needs of our community because it matters, but that we'd also be taking care of the word of God and, and prayer. Lord, let us not overlook the needs of our brothers and sisters and, and please help us to remove any obstacle or barrier that we can so that people might find the good news of your son and be transformed by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For these, you, those of you online will get started with worship in three minutes, but let's talk this morning.